Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, Chris Hughes from Rebound on Upstream Media's live YouTube and Facebook uh, show today. Welcome. I hope you're all well. Uh, really excited for tonight's show. We've got Victor Olerarin, um, who was with Nottingham uh, McDonald's Hoods last season. Uh, really excited for shows. Then uh, as we build up towards our perspective start, they feel be able to be good to sort of talk to hoops with uh, Victor. I hope you're well, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. All as well. How is you? How are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Busy day, been working, but now I'll just admit I enjoy most about the day, talking hoops. And I say I've really enjoyed having this show to talk basketball. I definitely felt like I learned some. I know a lot of viewers have too. If you're new to the channel, obviously give Upstream Media a like and subscribe for all the latest video content. Myself and many other hosts on here talking basketball will have our different niches of conversations and a really interesting show. Um, obviously, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you reached out to me after the t your coach came on and said you'd want to come on to talk to him. and great to talk to you. So I think in this country, as before lockdown, I think there wasn't enough people covering hoops. Maybe there is now. Um, what has been some benefits to you during this lockdown? So obviously it has been a challenging time and we were talking a bit off air, but maybe some of the benefits, I think it would be quite a nice light start to the uh, show. Yeah, um, now there's been quite a few benefits, believe it or not. Um, I just feel like just had a lot of time to think and just mature as a person, especially being like a young basketball player. Just had a lot of time just to like evaluate, look over tape, look over the whole season as a whole and just think what I can do better next season, what went well, what I need to carry on into next season, what I need to kind of drop, like obviously as well. Dealing with my, like sometimes, like when I'm looking at my body language at times when we're losing and stuff, like just work on little things that you don't really think is important, but they actually like, tell a bigger picture. Sounds really good. And I say it's great to have you on the show. Young British talent. Uh, obviously, with that D1 experience last year with Lot of the Hoods. Uh, we were talking off air because obviously, people who are listening and watching, we've got our first taste of NBL actually coming with the Challenge Cup. And obviously, you say you guys got Palais Leicester and you involved some great clash from last season. Talk to us a bit about that rivalry between the two clubs. What makes that game so special? It makes the game like, special because a lot of the players know each other as well. So whenever the scrimmage is in the summer, we're scrimmaging with a couple of the players. There's a good relationship between a couple of the players as well. And as well, we just always have to, like, we have a pretty similar team, I think. Every time we play against them, it's a tight game. It's a tough game, both athletic teams. And um, last year we had a game against them and it was really, really tight. And I was actually playing in that game. And I had a pretty decent game. They had, like, a really, really good American last year, which was tough. And then this year, the second game was on live on YouTube, and that was like a really, really good game, which I didn't actually get to play because I was injured. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to that game just to see what, like, you could tell how much we've improved from now and then. Definitely. Well. And obviously, it's been changed club, new new head coach. Um, obviously, without giving away too much to play, both an inside secret source. What has that done for the group having that new coach in? What, what are some of the uh, things you've taken away from the first few sessions? I just feel like a lot of players are now having to prove themselves a lot more. So no one's no one's playing like they've got a spot. It's everyone's fighting for a spot. So I feel like the intensity of training right now is like at its peak right now. I just feel like there's a lot of there's just a lot of just the competition level at training. Just it's like being in a game. Like literally when we come to playing at the like it's just yeah, it's tough, man. There's a lot to expect this year. Big um, big expectations this year. Definitely, I, I know everyone watches this missing basketball. It must be great to have that first session back. In, in the courts, on the on the court, sorry. H how long have you guys been on the court and back in, in some sort of training? I'd say about a month, maybe two months. A month, yeah, a month. We've been, yeah, a month. Yeah. We had like um, limited individual sessions with um, a number of people, only a couple of people, which wasn't really indoors, but the minute we got indoors, it's been, I can't even, I don't even remember. I'll probably say just over a month now. Definitely. Yeah. And with all the lot, with everything going on in the background, has has there been changes in terms of the workout? In terms of being able to do more stuff, what 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 has the the transition been? And what and how quick has that been? Yeah. To? We're, having to, we're having to take t-shirts. We're having to wash our hands. We're having to obviously comply with the rules. So that's different. Obviously, we're not allowed to shake hands. And as a player, like especially me being me, like I like to just dab up my teammates all the time. But it's hard. Like whenever you throw a good pass or something, someone gets like a dunk or something. It makes, it's hard not to like bump hands, but we're not allowed to do it. So that's one thing. Obviously, we've got to sanitize. We've got to keep our distance when we're getting changed. We have to come in in our gear, leaving our gear. Can't you know what I'm saying? So can't shower up there. Yeah. So it's it's different. I'm used Get to it now, but at first, yeah. 
I think that's the same with anything. I don't think we assume it's really adapt with a uh, great with change, but then once we adapt to it, we revive and obviously get back to yourself and your journey. What why we want to have you on the show tonight. Um, I myself am a fan and sort of covered past the last three or four years, and you came on my right radar that specific game, the NBL Life one. And um, obviously, Dave Owen was like, Where's Victor? I remember, and I was like, Oh, better look out this player. So, if Dave Owen says his name, he's definitely someone to be looking out for. And we'll talk a bit about off air. What um, influence has Dave Owen had on your, your career so far? Like, he's had a real big influence, even though, as I said, like, I haven't actually met Dave Owen in person, but he's had just a big influence. Like, I remember back, like, going back to Division Three days when I was at Lund United. Like, Division Three, no, even Division Four, sorry, going back to Division Four. Not a lot of, there's not a lot of attention around D4, I don't feel like. And I felt like Dave Owen was, every week he was coming up with top scorers, the averages, at the end of the season he was making sure D, uh, D4 and D3 were still relevant. And I feel like majority of the young talent that don't get to play D1 or D2, like there's a lot of talent in D4 and D3, which is like waiting to mature up into D1 level. So I felt like he really helped me just keep playing my heart out, keep playing hard. Like he was, I was able to like keep track of my stats and stuff because of him. Like, yeah, I respect him as a person, yeah. Def- definitely, I say he's probably one of the hardest working people in basketball to have his massive stat collection, which definitely aid us in our, uh, anything we do, any projects or any uh, articles. Um, and obviously, maybe for people watching, maybe outside Nottingham, maybe not a fair issue, maybe they should be. How did you get involved, basketball? When, when was that sort of initial urge to pick up basketball? When did that start for yourself? For me, it started with a coach called Coach Leon Dennis, and this was when I was in school. So I just, as I said, I used to play football, in case some of you guys didn't know. So I used to play football, and I remember we had like a little taster session at my school. And just because the, um, the pure athleticism from football, I just carried it over to basketball. And I remember I couldn't shoot at all. So for me, it was just fun running up and down, trying to get a ball into a hoop. And that was really the first time I ever really played the sport. And then from there, I just hit the coach up, literally straight after the session. I was like, yeah, I want to play. How can I play? And then from then, I literally went into um, CBL. So in London, there's Central Basketball League. And that's how I, that was my first taste of a basketball CBL. Running clock, I think it was 20 minutes, two halves of 20 minutes running clock. And you're playing against other CBL teams. And that was the first time I ever really played basketball. Uh, I say, um, I always get the impression that the basketball is massive in London. What were some of the things that really influenced you from your time in that London CBL? Um, who were some sort of player, people who stood out for you? What sort of um, inspired you to keep going? Just imagine you needed some of those people to keep you going on your journey. Yeah, just the culture, really, in London. Just the culture. Like, as I said, it's not in London, I feel like it's not so much about how good you are. It's just about the mentality and the culture. Like, when you go down there, you can tell there's a difference in mentality. So, for instance, like, in, in there's a difference in mentality compared to down here, I feel like. Just in London... I feel like there's more people that there's a lot more trash talking and stuff like that. Whereas up here, it's more, a lot more just like let your boss do the talking kind of thing. So I felt like that's what really helped me grow as a person, really, like for that mental toughness and stuff like that. But I felt like there was, as you said, there was a lot of people along the way which really helped me out. Like I played with Martel McLemore, TVC, I played with um, Prince, Benji. I, I used to watch them at Brunel, quite a few, like quite a few of their uni games. So. There's a lot of players around there which are willing to just talk to you, but a big one for me was Martel. Yeah, like being around Martel really helped. Definitely, and obviously he's a massive figure in terms of British basketball, his BBL experience at NBL. Were there any like inspirational things he said to you or parts of his game that you sort of really tried to copy? Or were you guys involved quite a lot of one-on-one scrimmages? Was he quite a tough battler? Did he... What, sort, what was his yeah. impact on you? Like, he was just... just hoop really just hoop it doesn't matter like i was never really that good especially when i was playing with d1 and i've just come out of cbl i'm not even division three or under 18 prem like i wasn't the greatest but he would just always have me doing so when i was playing on the team i wasn't really trying to score and stuff like that i used to just play defense and then he'd just be always telling me yeah good defense you're having a hell of a day da, 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 just stuff like that when you're young and you hear that stuff it just picks you back up kind of thing and then when all the when all the skills and that come like you get all the skills in your locker then it's like you got two things to go with, really. You've got the mentality and you've got the skill now. So now it's just about performing. <clears throat> and, and definitely, I'm, I'm going to cover him a bit more. Other D1 topics a bit. Um, and then obviously, I think a lot of people know for you, but 
your ABL years, you're obviously MVP in that big final. What were some of those highlights yeah. that time? It seemed quite a few, fruitful time for yourself. Yeah, those were those are the good days. Yeah, um, that was like them times there. Like I just moved from Uxbridge College, so that was a big move as well. Like I was just moving from like level to level kind of thing pretty quickly. So I moved to ABL, and I'm seeing a couple of my teammates are playing in Den Camp, and that was big for me because I was only playing AOC, which is just like five games a season. So now I'm playing with people like Afra, Elias Poorman, under Coach Jack and Coach Daniel. And we had a plan from the start that, listen, we're coming in to win the whole thing. So it was just, for me, it was just that we're winning games, we're winning games. And when it came to the tough games, it was like every game that we took was like, we have to win this game. Like, there's no way, other way about it. Like, this is a final every time. And then when it got to, like, the, um, the playoffs and stuff like that, it was just second nature because that's how we're taking the season the whole year. And then when we finally won the um, ABL, I remember I was a bit, I remember... We were staying in Leicester in the hotel the night before, and our coach just came out and told us about the um, the the MVP defensive players of this uh, of the season and stuff like that. And I remember I was I got all second team ABL, and at the time I was just really really annoyed. I don't know why I was just annoyed. I thought I was going to get first team. So I remember just going to sleep that night because I wasn't actually supposed to be playing that ABL final. I had um, I had whiplash on my neck, so I wasn't meant to be playing. So I had like a, the training sessions before. I wasn't playing. I wasn't playing. And then come the finals, obviously, I just had some a heat patch in my neck and then just kind of stuck it out. But once the adrenaline kicked in, it was just them. But I remember from the start of the game just thinking, yeah, I need to I need to perform this game because I just felt like I wasn't rated enough. I was put school So I just thought, yeah. And then when we won the ABL, I just, when the game started, for instance, uh, first is first, when the game started, I just started making my shots, getting the rhythm. I was just like, yeah, I just entered this zone now. And it was just like, yeah, from there, it was just, the confidence was just on 100. And it was just like, after the game had finished, like, I just so excited. I don't know why, but we won and then I got MVP. And then from there, it was just like, yeah, pure happiness. I came back to London. Everyone was just like, yeah, you've done it. Da, 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 that kind of thing. So, yeah, that was cool. Definitely, man. It sounds amazing. It's a great memories. And I, I often think British basketball, there's so many stories that are good under the radar. From your time at London United, who are some of the other players who sort of may not be the best? It's just like, I don't often like people having to pick the best players necessarily. But who are some players you think are a bit slept on for that time, maybe who aren't where you think they should be, or maybe not many people <clears> well. Who are some of the players that stuck out for you to be time at ABL but slept on? Yeah, I just, I genuinely just feel like honestly, I just feel like there's a lot of players on that team. Like I could, I genuinely feel like the whole team, like that year, that whole team was kind of slept on in general because I felt like after we'd won the ABL, none of us went to like the Den Camp, none of us went to anything like that, none of us really got recognition like that kind of thing. So I just felt like a lot of us were slept on kind of thing. But our coach used to just always tell us like our goal isn't to be here. Our goal is to go to Europe. Our goal is to go to America. So realistically, but I feel like if I had to pick a name or someone in particular that comes to mind, I'll say Afro. Because Afro, he's like, he's been like, really like, he's one of the best play guards I've ever played with. And like with him, he's playing D1 as well. He plays for Westminster Warriors. But um, yeah. there just doesn't like, seem to be a lot of noise around his name. But when you actually meet him and play against him, it's just like, yeah, he's like, He's tough, yeah, man. And as well, another one's Ilyas Pullman. You've got a couple of other guys on that team as well, like David Ass. There was a lot of people on that team. We had a really, really good team that year, like a really, really good team. Awesome. And like you say, coach taught you the goals to go to you for the marathon. I know you, you went to America next. What was that like as an experience? How was that for you? That was just completely different because, as I said, like at that point, I've been playing basketball, just basketball. Like I stopped playing football by the time for about, I think, three or two years, two, three years. So it's like you're getting a hundred things at once. And then all of a sudden now, I'm getting ready to go to America now. And all these things are getting added. So you got to get, you got to start getting a weight room. All these different defenses are getting introduced as well, which I'm not really used to. So that experience was, it was just, it was an experience, man. You have to like, yeah, it was an experience. Like, you're just seeing the culture of like, the culture wasn't too different to what London's like, if I said like, because there's a lot of trash talking in London as well. But it's just that, in America, like these players are like really, really good. Like they're really, really talented. And like I thought I was athletic, and I went out there, and like their whole team is just double athletic, like as athletic as I am. So yeah, we just, it was, it was good to see like what's going on around the world, like where was that kind of thing. Definitely. Do you feel like the competitiveness was that to another level in America? What maybe you used to in the UK? Yeah, I know because I've always just been over competitive with anything in it. Like so. I've been, like, any time it comes to, like, script, like, even at training, like, our coach will tell you, if we lose, I'll go home, like, upset. But it's, like, in America, it was different because everyone's on that same level. So everyone's on the same level as me. 
like like kind of in terms of they're all just trying to win some of them are even trying to win more than i am and i'm not really used to that so it's like yeah so it was yeah it was weird it was weird for me but then yeah. at first then it just it kind of helped me feel at home though at the same time because at the same time it was like all right cool so other people are like this how strong actually am i like mentally definitely and um, I know we were talking about off air, you know, you've got that dual interest in football and basketball. And you're saying that was that point where you had to drop football. How how far before that moment did you know that actually I might not make it a football, it's only basketball? Like with me, I just generally like my goal. So as I saw, I forgot to say, at Oxbridge, so I was at Oxbridge College. And at Oxbridge College, oh. I was playing football and I was doing really well. I was top basketball for the football team at the college. And I was just playing basketball because I could afford to do both at the same time. And then when I moved to Alec Reed, that's when they were like to me, all right, cool, yeah. Um, they have like proper programs. The ABL has a proper program. So we train every single day. So I'm not going to be able to train for football. But the head teacher at the school was a football coach as well for the for one of the teams that I used to play for, one of the Saturday league teams. So he knew I played football and my coach knew I played basketball. So there's a thing where... I wasn't allowed to go and play football. My coach said to me, nah, nah, like, you gotta, you got to play basketball, one or the other. So I picked basketball because it was a new sport. I was achieving newer goals. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to run with this. So I just like, left football to the side a little bit. I never actually had, um, had intended to drop it, but it's just something that comes after a while. Like, after a while, you're doing well at one sport. One of them is just going to have to go. So, yeah, football just ended up going. Of course. Well, I but think I in mean, this country... Yeah, Karen. No, Karen. I'd say I realised... Just when I'd won the ABL, that's when I realised. When, once I'd won the ABL and I won the MVP, I realised, yeah, football's probably it's the end of my football days. Oh, bless you. Uh, uh, do you still take an interest in watching football and seeing what's going on in that, in that world? Yeah, yeah. My younger brother actually still plays. So, yeah, he's doing really well at football as well. So I still, and I still got all my football friends as well. So, yeah, I still, yeah, still try to go down and watch games. Not allowed to play, but yeah. No, of course. Um, I'm always reach um, whenever I get a player one. Well, there's obviously who's in in that world who knows bits about it. How you know? Because I think there's a massive debate always going on about how can we grow British basketball. I'm, I was a football fan before I was a basketball, and I see so many things we can learn from football to make our game better. I'd really love your perspective. Is there parts of football where we need to bring to basketball either to raise the game as players or as a, a spectacle for to watch? Yeah, I feel like that's an interesting question. I had this conversation as well. But um, I feel like in terms of football, because football's been around and been the main sport in England for like for years now, I don't feel like I feel like football's just like at a high, like a solid level right now. But I feel like basketball's like it's going, it's getting towards there because obviously you've got the ABL, you've got the EABL, and obviously you had the AOC before. And like the ABL and EABL, like people are talking about the ABL and EABL like it's like a like it's like an American scholarship kind of thing. Like everyone's looking, like when you're coming out of high school, like secondary school, everyone's like, yeah, I want to go play EABL, I want to go play ABL. That's all they're talking about. Yeah, they want to go to America, but their main goal is to get into EABL and ABL teams. Like, So I feel like that's a good start kind of thing. But I just feel like once you finish at ABL and EABL, obviously the best, the best players on the team will obviously go off to America. And I just feel like the players that are just left over, I feel like that's where we're really struggling because there's not a lot of coverage on uni league. And actually, like I play at uni right now. And uni league's actually like really, really good because you got Americans that are coming over and playing as well. You got obviously the Prem Division. You're playing against some teams like Loughborough, Newcastle, Worcester, and they're like they've got BBL players on there as well. But I just feel like it's not actually advertised to the players as much as it should be, kind of thing. Like, so I feel like a lot of players feel like if they don't go to America, then it's kind of done. When that's not the case, kind of thing. No, I definitely hear you because I feel like. As a fan, I kind of started hearing about the ABL before I heard that Bucks, but Bucks deserves its own um, recognition too. Just like you say, you've got teams who D1 teams like Loughborough, who have a, pretty much a full roster plus the BBL guys there. Uh, East London Uni has a lot, some Lions players, Spice yeah, first yeah. with lots of Definitely. What is it But you think but the people do so right to get ABL on the map, but maybe not doing with Bucks? Other than the, the advertiser side of it? I don't know. I feel like, I, I just feel like the programs as well, I can under, I can understand why it may be like that. Because obviously, luckily at Trent, I feel like our program is just as close to ABL as it will like, as you're going to get really. But I feel like because when you go off to uni, there's other things as well. Some people like to live at uni life. Some people have got university studies. 
there's other distractions as well. Whereas when you're playing ABL and EABL, you're pretty much either staying in digs and just doing your A-levels and just training. And that's literally, that's all you can really do. Whereas at uni, you're kind of just thrown out there and you can do whatever you want. And you have to make sure that you're getting to training. You have to make sure that you're going. And I feel like quite a lot of people, they see it as they haven't gone to America. So now they're just going to play basketball just for a little bit on the side. They don't really have a end goal kind of thing. And I feel like it's, it's a, yeah, I just feel like it's a collect, it's a collective. It's between, it's, it's because of the players themselves. And as well, I feel like at the same time, universities as well i don't feel like some of the programs are giving the players an option or like an outlook to where they're going to go after kind of thing definitely i hear you there and uh, obviously you said yourself you, you played with trent in the butt what was uh maybe like give people a pressure back home for it, not just take our word for it but um who were some of like the toughest players you faced in in the uh butt competition i'd say I don't know the players' names, but I, I know the teams, like the toughest teams. We played against Worcester, they were tough, and yeah. they had like three BBL players. That was last year. This year, we played against Derby, and Derby was really strong this year. They had a couple of D, they have a D2 team as well, Derby Spartans, and a lot of their players are like really, really good. So we played against them. But I feel like in London as well, the Bucks, I feel like I know more players in London because obviously I'm from London. So I feel like in London, like the Bucks League is way more like it's really competitive down there, like really competitive. Like, there's a lot of players that are really good at a young age that have stayed on. And so you've got like Essex, you've got Brunel, you've got UEL, as you said, you've got Middlesex, like all them unis there, they're big universities. And it's like, when you go to their games, the crowd's packed out, like the basketball is really good level. It's just that a lot of their players don't get breakouts into Division One teams because either the university's not connected with them or they just don't have like the respect they kind of need. Yeah, definitely. I must be following some Instagram accounts, you definitely see some videos. Especially for guys like Bruno now, the fans seem very passionate about it and know what's going on and very connected with the team. So it must be really good to be involved in those days, especially if you grew up in London. Um, in terms of like fan experience, I know often, especially when you go to American colleges, it's, it's a different world, isn't it? You get a lot more followers. What are some of your highlights from like the fan experience? You know, being cheered on, like maybe like best to really play that or best, sorry. Best atmosphere you played at while you were in America? I'd say we had a couple of jamborees that were like packed out, like packed out. Yeah. And as well in America as well, because most people like, that are in America, are in, um, they're all staying on campus as well. So not only are the athletes spending on staying on campus, but all the students mainly are staying on campus as well. So it's like late at night. Also as well, the gyms out there, they're 24 hours, so you can go in there whenever you want. So you're you're going in there, you're scrimmaging against like students which are really good. You're like scrimmaging against like obviously all the dorms are just empty. Everyone's just always in the gym. Like no one's ever in their dorm. Come ten o'clock, everyone's just in the gym, just scrimmaging. And I felt like that just created more of a family like kind of thing because we're all just in there late night, just balling together, everyone. So when we come to games, it's like yeah, it was like the atmosphere was there. Like it was mad. It's crazy. But I don't feel like Definitely. the atmosphere over here is far off compared to what it is like over there. I feel like if you go down yeah. to Brunel, like Brunel on a Wednesday, like that's that's as close to the America you're gonna get. To be honest, I can't lie. Cause that one there, like there was a game winner that was hit, and like everyone just ran on the court, and it's just like, yeah, yeah. No, I've seen some amazing videos from like either the EABL, ABL, and it definitely seems like you definitely have that connected the family feel. I think you hit the um, nail on the head there, but the students they feel part of that basketball family because the basketball family feels part of that family I think some clubs have got rid of that and started that you definitely see it with me like so with Tesla's family and um, Hemel Worthing sort of building their fan base to make the fan base feel part of the team from when you were playing D1 last year what were some of the best uh, uh, game dates the atmospheres that you were part of in, um, in those games um, for me Derby versus Nottingham is always a big game like it's always just a like a, the atmosphere is always crazy, but I feel like um, I don't know. What was one of the biggest games? I feel like the Leicester Warriors game was a big game. The one that was that was on 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 YouTube. That was yeah, a yeah. big game as well. But like those sort of games, I didn't really get to play because I was injured. As I said, so I was just I like, like I remember we had a big game against Reading Rockets that went down to like that was a cup where we got knocked out, and that went down to like the wire. And that was like a really, really good game. But I was obviously on the side as well. I was injured. But yeah, yeah. it gets um, it gets loud. Well, and it gets loud. It gets loud. Yeah, like, I, the Wildcats. Yeah. 
of course. And I think that's something we don't miss next season. And I wonder whether what your thoughts are on the the artificial fan noise we've had at football, whether the guys at the uh, uh, at your arena be uh, pumping fake noise. What what what's your thoughts? Is, do you think it's more distracting, or do you make is, does it feel a bit uh, makes it a better situation? I feel like, I don't, I don't know, because I haven't really experienced it, but I don't feel like you can really match the noise from a crowd. Like, you can have all these, like, systems in place which will, like, make it game-like, but I just don't feel it's, like, it's the same. So I just feel like, nah, I don't feel I'll do a lot. I must admit, I feel a bit guilty, because like, at first, like, no, can't stand it, can't stand it. And I was watching a football game, but I realised if I was doing research for a show, and I had football in the background, and I was just listening to sound, and I was like, felt nostalgia. <laughs> it's silly, because it's just a recorded thing, but... Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. The, football, the football ones, I feel like, is... I've gotten used to the football one because I've been watching a lot of the football yeah. in it, so I've gotten used to that one. But the basketball ones, really, I haven't really got used to the basketball one yet, the NBA one. I haven't no. really... No, I, I don't think I've heard it. No, I think it's different atmosphere, so it's always uh, on the go. And, yeah. um, obviously, you know, you were injured for us, but you were fit a few games. I know you had that really good spell in November. What were some of your highlights from this season when you were on the court playing? Just, I just felt like when I was, whenever I was playing last year, I just felt like I had no sort of pressure on me. I don't know why, but I just felt like I was just playing, just being myself and playing. So I felt like that's why I was like playing really well last season because I wasn't really thinking about anything else, but just trying to score and trying to like play defense, trying to get assists, trying to get steals. So nothing else really mattered to me. And then the numbers started to fly in, but I wasn't really getting a lot of minutes last year. So with me, it was just that like, I'll be going out there for 10 minutes. I was like, you know, for 10 minutes, I'm just going to go out there and just play my heart. 10 minutes and then every time that would happen like at the end of the game like i look online and say i had like 17 or 18 in 10 minutes i was just like i didn't expect that but it's like yeah i was going hard for like 10 minutes so i said it's like it's in basketball sort of like it's how much you do when you're on the court so like i do appreciate but like yes it's straight not getting the minutes but when you you made the most of it and got you know it's a good yeah. output like you got uh, i think it was 17 that's worth it and that was level four, so you did really well, sort of a 20 class. Um, in yeah. terms of D1, obviously, you talk about Matt Clamore. Uh, are there other players that stick out to you as sort of players that really excite either to watch play or have inspired you along your journey so far? I'd say also as well, Tintin as well. Like when I came in as well, like when I came in at first, I was kind of young, so everyone was just trying to like show me the ways. Everything's new to me. And obviously, I've come from London as well, so I'm talking at training, whereas down here, as I said, it's normally like just playing your, your game will um, talk for you kind of thing. So it was kind of like, it was a it was a culture change for me. But I just felt like just watching Tintin and stuff like that, because I'd heard these names like Tintin, Delaney, Kieran, like I'd heard these names when I was in London, I heard of all of them. But it's just like when you're actually in a change room now, after training, and you're just there, like I was young, I was like, I think 19, 18. And like, I'm just there listening to all these conversations and changing, I'm like, like, I'm playing men's now, innit? So it was just... yeah. <laughs> and obviously, we brought about a second uh, NBL live game, and obviously, Tintin was behind the mic. I thought he did really well for his debut. Um, do you remember any of that part of it when you're watching game? What do you think of the commentary? Because I think the NBL live was a really good positive from last season. So, what was that? Sorry, say that again. So, I um, we were just saying because obviously, Tintin's a big person for you, and um, in that second NBL live, I'm not sure if you remember, but he was on the mic duties, I think, with John Hobbs, and I thought he did a really good job. Uh, do you remember much of that, or were you more focused on the day itself? Against, against TVC, wasn't it? Was uh, it TVC? No, no, what it was, was the that Leicester game? Derby. The, Dar- See, the yeah, Derby game you were injured for. Yeah, the Leicester Derby. I was, I was at home. I, I couldn't move. I was on my bed. I was in a boot. So I was watching a game from there. But yeah, I remember, yeah. It was good to see Tintin on there. I think you should get on there Def- more, man. You guys should get on there yeah, more. Definitely, definitely. And I really hope they do more NBL Live next season. I think it was a real good highlight, I think. It got more people aware of the talents in the league. Obviously, you had your injury. How, how are you feeling at the moment? Are you feeling that, like that injury's been a pass, or do you still feel, feel a bit of a niggle from time to time? I don't know. Like, it's, it was a weird one because I'd never really been injured before. Never. Like, I'd had like little niggles, but I just play through them. Like, when you're young, you just catch knocks and you can't play them. Whereas this was the first time where I got injured and I just genuinely couldn't operate on a day to day basis. So for me, it was like, a, it, was, it was a tough time. At the start of it, but then it was just like my coach and my, uh, my physio just reassuring me that everything was going to be cool. So then after I got over that and I started walking again, it was just like, all right, cool. I want to get back on the court as quick as possible. And I was, 
because I'm young, I was trying to rush it. And my coach just kept saying to me, like, don't rush it. Because obviously I'm an athletic type player. So I need so injuries like this. He kept saying to me, I need to take care of them. Which, to be fair, like, Ryan did a really good job of stopping me from playing. Like, I remember he had to ban me from kitting up, all these sort of things. But now it's just like, yeah, now my ankle's just back to 100. I've just been working out of there. Now I don't like, but now I feel like moving forward, I'm just going to make more of an effort to just get in the gym and look after my body more just to prevent injuries because it could have been prevented, I feel like. Definitely. And I say it was unfortunate uh, Coach Ryan had to leave. I know he's at Derby Spartans. And, you know, he's always come across a really cool chap, uh, a nice guy. And before we sort of move on from the last season, what were some of like, the highlights off the court? Were there like uh, any funny stories or, you know, anything about it in the summer as a stuff you feel, oh, I remember that moment, that was really good, I miss that. What what's some of the mem- memories you from last season off the court? Yeah, like, I just felt like, because I was like one of the younger players on the, on, the, on the team, I was just basically the clown. I was just always getting clowned on me. Like, so, like, I just felt like there was always a laugh, like away games, like the change room, just change rooms after training would just be always be funny and just catching a laugh with the boys. So, like, there was loads of memories. Couldn't really pick out one in particular, I don't know. But there were just loads that we just had a laugh all the time, man. Like, all the time. That's, that's good to hear. And uh, we said earlier about sort of with this break, it's giving you time to reflect, sort of look at your game, maybe like watch a bit more tape. Is there something in particular you, you think about adding to your game for next season or maybe do something differently? What, what sort of thoughts you had in terms of when you reflected on your own game and what you'd like to see? Make, make little changes here or there? Um, there's a couple of things. Firstly, I think that my mid-range game, I'd like to improve that because I get majority of my baskets going to the basket. <coughs> so it's like, I need to now adapt because I'm not always going to be able to get to the basket at times. So I need to now adapt to like getting mid-range shots. But over quarantine, I was really just watching like a lot of European basketball. Like Kieran Wright was telling me, just sending me videos all the time, just watching European basketball, watching European basketball as to like how they're moving the ball, always finding the extra pass trying to go left a bit more, obviously, drawing defenders in. And when I'm going to the basket, instead of going up against two people and trying to dunk on something, there's someone open on the baseline, which I didn't really used to see until I started watching European basketball kind of thing. And then I used to get caught up in watching a lot of the NBA, which, like, my coach used to tell me was my biggest killer because the NBA is just, like, these are superstars that are just trying to get highlights kind of thing, in a sense. So, yeah, he just told me to just watch a lot of European basketball and just try to learn the game. Definitely. In terms of like soaking it up, improving your IQ, have you found like the watching it has been your best way, or are you, you know, is it more practice now in terms of training or listening to coach? What do you find is best sort of learning with basketball? I feel like I feel like if you haven't, like, I had the opportunity to go to EYBL and play in Europe. So for me, when I was watching it, it wasn't like I'd played there before on numerous occasions, like three times. Like, we went on three trips, so I'd obviously seen a bit of European basketball. But I feel like watching if you just substitute the NBA for yearly for like a week or something like you don't even need to watch like all the games or if you want to watch like the Olympics like just watch Spain and all these other Lithuanian stuff like that like, I feel like that will really like sit in the back of your head because you're watching the point guards there and like some of the passes that they're making are just simple passes which open up all the time but people just don't see it and I, like, I never used to see it either so I can't say until about yeah the more you watch it the more you see it yeah no, I think I think that's very true at every level and um and, you know, obviously, you learn something that would be interesting to see how you guys get on next year. And obviously, you've got the Challenge Cup coming up, which you say you guys got Leicester. When look at the teams and sort of at the scouts, I imagine you guys look at the scout. What teams do you think is toughest to um, attack against? Because I imagine there's some teams you think, oh, they've got a really good defence, or others. Who do you feel is maybe the toughest ones to sort of unlock that defence? I feel like Solon are a really good defensive team. We have talked about Solon a lot. Like they're a really good defensive team. The stats show it as well. Um, I feel like TBC is also a really good defensive team because they just really they've got a lot of height on their team. I just remember having a tough game against Hemel because they had a really big uh, they had a big man that was kind of tall and big. So those three teams stuck out for me. But as I said, until the, like the season starts and like there's more tape, I can't really we can't really see as to what teams are going to be hard that. to score against. Definitely, I'll say, I think... Yep. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so, in terms of like training, obviously, you guys probably forming that chemistry. What's really excited you in training? Um, so, like, as some guys got really good dunks, or have you got a lot of three point shooters? What's 
been some of the real good takeaways for you from Trey so far? I just feel like we've had a lot of a lot more younger people in the session as well. So I feel like just that like the athletics, the speed of training now has improved is like has increased a lot as well. I feel like we've got a lot of shooters. We've always had a lot of shooters. I just feel like the athleticism, there's a lot of like highlights as well. There's a lot of dunks at training. And I just I'm just enjoying training as it is right now. Just because we're on the court and as well, because like I'm playing with my teammates that I've been with like for two years now. So it's like kinda like we're we're building relationships off the court as well. So I'm just enjoying training. Same time, definitely, yeah. definitely. I think um, it's interesting. Obviously, we had coach on a few weeks ago. And he was saying how he is, he was in two minds whether of his recruitment plans in terms of that said, like you just said, there's a lot of young players maybe blooded. So, it'll be really interested to see how you guys get. I don't obviously want to get you in trouble over feeling names, who's in training, or anything like that. Um, but yeah. obviously, you, you said like Chase, maybe else, that's really good. Um, in terms of the challenge trap, what do you guys know about Leicester so far? Just say last season, I think they were quite late with Leicester team. What what sort of things are you expecting from Leicester as we you sort of come towards this challenge trap? They're they're a well coached team. I know they've got a really good coach, Carl Brown. They're obviously an athletic team as well. So I just feel like we haven't. I just feel like it will be a tough game. It's gonna be a nitty gritty game. But I just feel like in terms of Right now, what's going on right now in terms of like the footage and tape? There hasn't been a lot of games, so for us, really, like, there's, you don't really know what to expect from other teams until you really play against them. But yeah. look at the game last season. We know that they're a really good team. They're athletic. They can shoot the ball. They've got yeah. Their defense think, is pretty good as well. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised to hear about the challenge, but actually, the more I think about it, more sounds like a good idea. Do you think the challenge could be a really good way to sort of get us ready for the league? Just like you say, there's. Be no pre season, you've probably not got much to go on. Do you think the challenge cup be a really good thing to start this season up? Yeah, I feel like, yeah, definitely. Because I wasn't aware of the challenge cup until literally our coach said, Okay, we've got challenge cup our first game on the 3rd of October. And I was like, Yeah, actually, that's a really, really good idea. Because I was more so thinking, How is the season going to start? Like, teams are going to be um, slow out the gates, kind of thing, getting out because a lot of people haven't played in a while. So I just feel like, yeah, the Challenge Cup will be a really good opportunity. And as well, it's not just a friendly, it's like an actual cup as well. So you're actually playing for something as well. So I feel like, yeah, it's a really good opportunity just to see where everyone's at. And as well, it helps teams with scout reports and that for the, um, for the season. Because there's a lot of use, yeah. um, new signings, but there's not a lot. You can't really take a lot from that. You don't know how the player plays. You don't know what tendencies are like. So, yeah. Definitely. So anyone watching um, the Challenge Cup, I think it's, uh, I think the most teams play is three games. I think it's over three weekends. Lead up to new season, and obviously we're not to have the national cup this year, so it's kind of like the replacement cup, but also like a like we just said, sort of a way to sort of build up match fitness, but also get to know sort of a competition. You mentioned some new signings, obviously BBL Fit do a great job sharing all those signings. I've if you had to pick a few signings, who's really excited you from in terms of players you'll be playing against in the NBL next season? Sorry, say that, say that last bit again, sorry. Uh, obviously, you probably have an idea of some of the sides, like we just mentioned. Are there any that stick out for you as excited to play against many players you thought, oh, I've never thought I'd get a chance to, or I see a tape of that guy, he looks good. Who's some of the players you, you're sort of looking forward to uh, matching up against? Um, <clears throat> there's quite a few players that I've seen out there. I don't really, I don't really pay, I pay attention to it, but I don't really like remember names and stuff. But I know that... Um, Red and Rockets have signed a couple of players, a couple of Americans, and I've just seen like quite a few um, teams signing Americans. I know Solon's um, signed Olin Jackman, Andre Arisol. There's, they got like a really good team, so I'm excited to play against them just to see, like, because those are big names. So I'm just excited to play against them. But other than that, really, I just try not to like pay attention. I just try to work on my own game, kind of thing. So I don't really like get caught up in signing and stuff. I just want to just yeah, that's my game and just yeah. That's good my mentality. Tab. And uh, obviously, yeah, training last night. How did that? How did that training session go? Was it? Was it all go to plan? Yeah, that was a tiring one, man. A lot of coach had us running a lot, but yeah, just we we're just building up like base things, like mental toughness as well. Like obviously, we're tired, making the right decision when we're tired. Obviously, playing at the end as well when we literally our legs are dead, but we have to carry on going. But yeah, I feel like each session we're just improving as a team. Like literally, we see us from the start when we first came into like now. 
it's like me, even me as a person, I'm improving as well. Like, as I was saying, I was watching a lot of European basketball, but like he's actually putting that into play and showing me actually, you know what, this isn't the right pass. Like you could have got a better pass. Like what's best for the team? You know what I'm saying? So that, like, yeah, what's best for the team Definitely. and stuff. And obviously, you know, it's really great, but you're, you're focused on your own journey and what you, you guys are doing. Um, and obviously, lockdown has given us a lot of time to look elsewhere. Have you had time or time to look at other hobbies or in times? What what have, what stuff has you done to keep yourself busy during this time? Because it has been a, a long time for some. Literally just been catching up with uni work, man. <laughs> like uni yeah. work, trying to watch a lot of basketball, just... I look out for the news as well, just to see what's going on around the world and stuff. But yeah, that's of that. Definitely. Just pretty much just work, trying to just stay productive, really. Definitely. And as Solis grew up in London, I, I like to talk about this. I think it's quite a big story, British basketball. Um, have you had any thoughts on London Lions? Who the team in taps to them? So obviously, I don't play in Europe this year. What, what impact do you think that could have for British basketball? I think that's like a big effect. That's, that, that's going to like have a big effect on the English basketball because... Like their team has got like a really good chance of like really going out there and doing really well, and I feel like if they do really well, that will put England on the map as well. Other other countries will just see England and see like London Lions could be the club, the face maybe, and just be in that in that um, in that tournament every year and potentially win it. If they win it, then other countries are gonna look oh, at England. And think, okay, it. maybe yeah, yeah, maybe they've got something, and they've got like a lot of tough players, man. They've got ex NBA players as well. It's just it's wild. I'm just looking at I'm just looking at Instagram and just seeing. At one point, I was just seeing an NBA player getting signed. I saw another one. I saw loads of Americans come to sign. So, yeah. This is getting... uh, and to be fair, it's not just the lives. I think a few guys have signed, play, a few teams sorry, have signed players with NBA G League experience. So it definitely seems the caliber is going up, just hopefully, me. this season. Just, and obviously, without being too much, what, what maybe some of your personal aims and team aims, either just for the challenge cup or maybe for the season whole of you, sort of started thinking about what, what to expect? I feel like for this season, I feel like we're definitely trying to make playoffs. Obviously, the, um, the Cup would love to win it, obviously. Who wouldn't? And as well, just personal goals, really, just to like go, keep going as a player, keep being a leader, just build myself up to like just be the best player I can, really. And definitely. obviously help my team out as much as possible as well. Definitely. I say, I really appreciate you coming on. It's thank you for reaching out. It's, it's... Quite nice, and I get a message tag on your show. I was like, of course you can. I love to talk to you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to discuss? I know we sort of touched on bits. We haven't really spoke about the American stuff, but was there anything there you wanted to cover a bit more? Yeah, I just feel like um, a lot of people just feel like America is like the only way, and feel like if it's Amer- if it's not America, then there's no way. But I just feel like that's like the wrong mindset. I just feel like. Like, as you can see, you're seeing a lot of people, Americans that are coming over here and playing in Division One and playing in BBL. So, therefore, you should just like look at it and just feel like, if I can get a head start and start playing at this level and playing against some of these guys, because I feel like, like England just slept on it in general. Like, there's so many Americans that come over here. Like, the talent that you're playing against, you're playing against players that come from, I come from what team? There's players that come from all over D1, like big D1 schools, Division One schools that are playing in the same league as you. So just because you haven't gone to America doesn't mean that you can't play at a high level. Like you're still playing at a really high level. So I just feel like a lot of players should just take it, try to get themselves into like a Division One, Division Two, even Division Three, and just work their way up. Everyone has their own journey. Def- definitely, I think that definitely seems to be the the blueprint for most players to to go to America. Obviously, it's obviously it's probably a safe place to go. You not the language barrier all sorted. Whereas maybe going to something like France, Spain might be a bit more daunting for like. Uh, have to learn language and also chase that NBA dream. And I think often the British Basketball is debated about how do we stop people doing that, maybe look at other options. But I think often it's about making sure they have the best opportunity when they come back. So I don't think we're going to stop people chasing the NBA. It's like, you know, probably as a footballer, a lot of footballers will say, oh, I want to play in the Premier League or I want to play in the league. You're not going to change players want to play with the best leagues or in the country with best yeah. leagues. Do you think, not to be critical of, of BBL, NBL, what do you think could be done more to sort of entice so the guys who are tried in America to make it feel like they want to come back to England instead of maybe going abroad? What sort of things do you think we could do better at, possibly? I just feel like, I don't know if there's a lot, I feel like it's just moving in the right direction. To be honest. I can't really see anything that they're not, like, 
any room for improvement. Like, obviously, there's always room for improvement, but I just of course. don't know what to suggest. I just, like, right now, it's like a really good, we're going in a really good direction kind of thing. Obviously, having a lot more Americans coming over here, you've got a lot more bigger players that are coming back now to play in this league. So it's like, maybe it makes the decision, especially what's going on in the world right now with the coronavirus. Like, I feel like if I was put in this position, like, if I, were, if I go back two years and I was in this position right now, I'd be kind of reluctant to go to America. I'd just be thinking that there's a lot of people coming to back to this country, a lot of Americans coming here. Why not just stay here and just, just play? So Definitely. I just feel like they're doing a good Definitely. It seems quite a lot of mental uh, object result home back. I think Holly Winterford's come back. It's quite a lot of British talent coming back to staying here. Actually, it might make for a really, really enticing season to have these high-level players on our doorstep and more people wear of them. And I love how you say that if you're in this climate now, you twice choose to stay. But what if we didn't have COVID and you redo your journey again? Would there be either a bit of advice you'd give yourself or what other options would you have considered for maybe not going to America? Or would you still want to stay? Uh, I would have considered, I really wanted to go, that was just a goal of mine. So with me, like a lot of players, a lot of people had said to me, yeah, going to America, they told me that it, like the, the, pos, the pros and cons. But I just feel mm. like with me, it was just, I had a personal goal to go to America. So whatever anyone told me, I wasn't really going to listen at that time. But I feel like just you, people know what's best for them. But at the same time, I just feel like they should just research other things as well, other opportunities as well. Like obviously going to university like UEL, going to something like Loughborough. And then I'll say as well, what thing that's really important is finding a team, a, a team or, or a BBL team that's linked to the university. Because you can find that, then that could be, that's somewhere which you can progress to. Like find a team where you can progress them. And then from them, once you build up Definitely. yourself, then you could just, yeah. I, I do like how Loughborough have that sort of uh, conveyor belt from like Chambered to Loughborough to Leicester. No. It definitely worked well. And I kind of think that's the best motivation for a player. Like you saw uh, Jonas Dieterich, who sort of went from the Loughborough third or fourth team all the way to BBL. As a player, is that like the best motivation to have to know that you're not just playing for that team is potential to have that pathway to BBL. Do you think that's like the best incentive to have? Yeah, like it just makes you work hard as well. And also, as well, not only are you just playing for under the like under the team's name, but at the same time as well, you're you're playing around like you're seeing these 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 BBL players around as well. Because if you're playing at Academy at Charmwood, you're under the same name, so you're seeing these BBL players. You could talk to them. You could do whatever you want. Like, so yeah, I feel like that helps a lot. Definitely, and. Um, obviously, you've got to read to handle it, which has obviously been through the press yourself. There's lots of great academy teams out there who either have uh, senior NBL teams or play at EYBL or play or have affiliations to NBL, BBL teams. What are some of the EYBL teams that maybe people don't know but should have that same recognition that maybe don't have that strong social media pool or have maybe the star player? Is there some teams you think are... Uh, Aren't, aren't, don't get as much recognition as they deserve. What, ABL team, sorry, do you say? Yeah, ABL, EABL, sort of grassroots, because I think like everyone would know Myers Straff. I mean, Harry and G's sort of come more to the boil this season. Um, Charwood obviously has that. Everyone knows Charwood is linked with Leicester, to link with Loughborough, but are there others that you think are doing a real good job, but maybe just don't have the full piece of tape to really be on everyone's radar? Off the top of my head, I couldn't really, but I feel like there's a lot of teams that could relate to what you just said as well. Like, there's a lot of teams out there which really could get out there, but it's just like, not a lot. I don't know where it is. Like, because you've got Barking Abbey, you've got Maesco and that, and they've got mixtapes for everyone coming out, coming out. So that's why a lot of players want to go there kind of thing, because it's like, you're seeing them over Insta, you're seeing them on the Hoots, you're seeing them everywhere. So I feel like just, Majority of teams in, in like in the ABL and stuff could do like a, there's room for improvement for a lot of teams. Like if they were to go out there and just obviously not say make mixtapes for everyone, but obviously just push it a bit more on Instagram. Like social media right yeah. now is the biggest platform right now. For so yeah, like definitely. I think that is one way British basketball to um, improve. Maybe not maybe not improve, but more awareness. I feel like the one of the main problems is actually us enticing new foot new um new uh, people to see it because I think what's the classic is summer so we've got so many new people coming out there but then it's sort of alienating the group because everyone's seen the same post by 
maybe eight or nine different people, but actually none of us are reaching a new audience. As someone who maybe yeah. watch football being in America, how, maybe it might not be pressure, you might not be able to, it's quite a difficult one. I think a lot of people would love to know the answer. How do you think basketball to reach a big audience, maybe to sort of compete with other sports? Is that something you think they're not doing? Um, I don't I just feel like as well, each team could do a better job. Like in a city, so obviously, essentially, you're playing for, you're representing a city at the same time. So I feel like maybe yeah. teams just going out into the city, getting more fan base, more fan love. Because a lot of people out there, like the main sport is football. When they think about basketball, they just think, oh, basketball's not that big. Whereas actually, basketball's kind of big in this country. So I feel like if they were to actually just go to a game one day, or maybe like teams were to go out there and like introduce themselves to like the city, then they'll get a lot more fan, like fan fans coming through the door and then obviously that'll grow their fan base as well especially as well with younger people as well the trend right now is like you just gotta follow the trend kind of thing definitely like what kids are doing, that's, that's the yeah i think you also has a real unique thing so you say about how when you're at school you had a coach that like basketball and sort of got you towards that for talk to players do you think that's the same story across the board or do you think actually in terms of pe at school Barcelona's really missed because people always pick sort of to do football, rugby or hockey. Do you think maybe schools need to do a bit more? Yeah, I feel like schools do a really good job anyway because that's essentially how I really started playing basketball. Like we had a session one day where they brought someone in from basketball into our school and we used to always have like taster sessions. We did cricket, hockey, every sport, my school personally. So like, I feel like schools, I can't speak on every school, but I feel like my school did a good job of doing that. But Definitely. I just feel like it's just, as I said, just taking players from this level to the higher level. Like, how can you move players onto the next level kind of thing? Because you work hard from, like, under-18s, you get yourself up to EABL, then once your third year EABL is finished, a lot of players just don't know what they want to do after. And I feel like that's the biggest issue kind of thing. Definitely. And um, obviously, we got this season, we're not sure what's going to happen in terms of the games and the challenge of a really good opportunity for you guys. Um, and we talked a bit about the NBL live, how maybe the impact of live stream coming. Do you think, like fans, if there is the option, do you think fans will want to come to watch games? Maybe people have a, um, anxiety about being out with COVID. Um, or do you think we should probably drive towards more digital content in terms of live stream? What What do you think is sort of the maybe the best solution in a, a tricky situation? It's really, it's a really a tricky situation, as you said, because. I would personally love to have fans back in and watching it again. But then at the same time, there's a global pandemic as well. So you got like, I understand that maybe people may want, like, even if we do invite fans, fans may not even want to like turn up like that because of the fear of COVID. So I feel like it's just a thing where teams are going to have to sit down and see what's best for them. Cause I feel like what's best for us may not be best for other teams. You know what I'm saying? So it all just depends really. But I just, yeah, I just want this coronavirus to be over really. <laughs> So Mate, I, I think you're, you're, you're singing to the choir. I'm pretty sure everyone listening is saying, yeah, Ali, we'd love that to be the solution uh, yeah, to, to yeah. be there. Because I think it's been quite a challenging time. What, as someone who's, you know, looking after themselves, making sure they're fit and healthy and, you know, working on improving each day, I think I always really like getting the players' perspective. What advice do you give to that few at home who maybe it's struggling at the moment in terms of a bit of advice you think might help them? Just don't stop working, really. That's like that's the biggest thing for me as well. Like, there's times where you're just tired, you don't want to work out. Just think of like when you don't have to work out no more, and you've made it to where you want to go. Because that really does. When you do get to the level that you've been working for, it really does. It's like a it's a better feeling than anything else. Like when I first touched down in America, like I remember setting that goal out for myself, and I remember like actually landing in America. I was like, this is the best feeling I've ever had. So just feel like just keep working out, keep working out, keep working out. You can never work out too much. I know coaches like to say, obviously, you've got to rest on that, which obviously you got to listen to them. I'm young, so I don't really listen to that a lot. But I feel like, obviously, listen to your coaches. You've got to rest as well. But at the same time, just always be doing something which is going to make you better. Like, it Definitely. doesn't even need to be just going to fucking shoot. You can literally just sit at home and watch like, watch Euroly, watch um, analysis, like, whatever position you play, just watch that. Definitely. I think that's a read to the fire. So I can imagine that you're sort of like a really sort of big character that has that purse in a, that dressing room and I'd love to sort of finish maybe a little bit into depth sort of the sort of personalities and the hoods maybe like who on the way trip she said she sort of like be the joker so who sort of controls the radio um who who does like the best prank what sort of 
standout personalities in, in that group. Obviously, you can't, probably won't be able to cover everyone, but who, some of you that stick out for yourself. I just feel like the team, like last year, the team was just full of personalities. We had Demetrius from America. Obviously, we had Garrison as well from California. Like we just had a, like we had, last year was like, we had people from all over the place last year. We had what, a Canadian, we had someone from Holland, Laritz. Obviously, Laritz was like the smarter one. Obviously, with me, I'm not, I wouldn't really class myself as the smartest person in the world. But yeah, yeah. me and Laritz got along. Like, like, that was always a laugh. I'd say Kieran as well. When Kieran came back in, Delaney's always a laugh. Like, I just felt like the whole team was laugh. Like, Ryan would always be pranking someone. But yeah. It definitely, from the outside, it definitely looked like an eclectic mix. You also mentioned Garrison, who has his fashion. Were there any others who sort of match his best dress? Who, who sort of players um, who, who sort of try and make the, um, make the impression when going out or on the bus? I'd say um, Delaney, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, without a shadow of that. Yeah, yeah, he takes that one. <laughs> definitely. And one of the things about one of the other team has hit Tom Axon, he does all his trick shots. And obviously, you know, in training, you try to get dunks. Uh, who's sort of like the best dunk or the trick shot from that group from last year? Ooh. Kieran will always be coming up with some weird, weird move or something. I'd yeah. say Delaney just makes some crazy, ridiculous shots from like places which you never think you'd make it from. I'd say in terms of, yeah, I'd say... Obviously, Luke Mitchell as well. Yeah, Luke Mitchell's a trick shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about Luke. Yeah, Luke. It definitely has to be Luke because he would be like bouncing the ball off the wall. I don't know if you follow the Instagram page, but every Monday, yeah. it'll be trick shot Monday or something. And he would have like some ridiculous. I wouldn't even that. Like, I'll just go home and watch on Instagram thinking. Actually, yeah. then again, you got Tom at as well. Yeah. Tom as well. Yeah. We had like, yeah, yeah. Say Tom and Luke take that one. Definitely. Uh, and yeah. then, like, on, on the trips, right? So obviously, there's a lot with MBLD while you're at Teams Far. It's Liverpool and so it's obviously long car journeys, who all drive pool. Who who would sort of control the uh, the uh, aux lead as it were, or is it all Bluetooth or uh... it let me be Bluetooth, I'd probably say like Delaney will probably take that or yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. Wouldn't give it to Kieran or anyone. <laughs> Definitely. And um awesome. Um uh, I say I say thank you Dave for coming on. Is there sort of a message you'd like to say to the Hoods family who are watching and tuning in? Maybe something you'd just like to say, maybe thank them for last season or, or anything you feel like you'd like to say to the Hoods family? Yeah, just thank you for the support. Like, they just show a lot of love. Like, some of the fans as well, they like, travel that like, far. Every time You mentioned every time you've got a far game, like, game that's far, sorry. Like, there's always fans that are coming down as well. And I don't even know how they get there. Like, I'll just pull up to start warming up and they'll be there. So, like, yeah, they just show nothing but love and just continue all the support, man. Hopefully, we're going to bring something home one day, man. Definitely. We look forward to see how you guys get on the challenge to happen next season. I'm sure fans of every team look forward to when they come back to watch basketball. Uh, you, you continue to do your work, man. It's been great chatting to you. Lovely to get your personality across the screen. Just often, if you just do yeah. you don't read it, the full thing. So it's been great chatting to you. Uh, stay safe. All yeah, the yeah. best of the season. The fact you've been on. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate That's it. Right. Anyways, take care. Uh, goodbye from us and stay safe. And we'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Thanks.